Seeker, written by Susanna Thompson, performed by Heather Firth. Chapter 10 Every trace of supernatural contact I had with Silas is gone. Even my special earring is now a plain gold hoop. For some inexplicable reason, I'm disappointed with the now ordinary nature of Silas's life. He was death. I remind myself. All he did was attend to the dying. His life will be so much better now. He'll actually get to live. He'll die, Abel tells me as he pops up out of nowhere. I drop the earring I'd been holding in my hand and gazing at. What? He's dying? You're all dying, he states. One day his time will run out. I settle back in relief. Someday, but not now. He would have lived until the end of time, Abel says. Aren't you bored? I ask, even though I'd also felt oddly discontented with the change in Silas's circumstances. Seeing people's memories isn't the same as doing those things yourself. Don't you want to experience life? His reply has nothing to do with my question. Go to the address tomorrow if he doesn't want to attend the academy. His guardian can make other arrangements. Guardian? I question in dismay. I thought you said the guy was dying. Who's his guardian? The benefactor's lawyer. He answers in that raw, parched voice that Silas used to have. He was a hitman. His lawyer was a hitman? I ask in bewilderment. No, Abel replies. The benefactor was. And you told him he was going to heaven? I demand in outrage. Murderers have been forgiven before, he states emotionlessly. Some of the saints were killers before they repented. I'm still upset by what he did. You could have found a nice person to help him. I needed someone who could procure false identification, he explains. Only a criminal could do that. He has a point, but I still don't like that Silas has been placed in this shady situation. What if he gets in trouble? He won't, Abel assures me in his neutral tone that brings no comfort to me. The police weren't aware of the man's illegal activities, and they're unlikely to investigate him now that he's dead. He continues before I can respond. I must attend to the dying. Go to the address if he wishes not to live at the seminary. Wait, I call out quickly. What's a seminary? A school for priests, Abel tells me. That wasn't the kind of boarding school I had imagined for Silas but he doesn't have anywhere else to go. Why wouldn't he want to live there? He's talking to girls, Abel replies and disappears. Before I can comprehend the implications of that statement, Mom barges into my room. Mila, who are you talking to? She glances around and sees that I'm alone. I gesture toward my open laptop. I was just watching a video, and I was talking to the screen, I guess. I finish lamely. It'll get better, Mom assures me, and her soft tone is comforting. I know it's hard now, but it'll get better. I realize that she's talking about the death of my friends. Everything that's been going on with Silas had distracted me from thinking about them, and I was purposely avoiding thinking about Chloe after what I learned at the cemetery today. I smile wanly at mom. I know. That boy, Silas. She apparently isn't sure what to say about him. Uh, is he a new friend? I guess, I reply. She misunderstands the reason for my lack of enthusiasm. I know you're bonding over your grief for Scott, but maybe you should try to socialize with someone who wasn't friends with him. 
Why? I question in puzzlement. I think it would help you to make a fresh start, she tells me. You need to grieve, of course, but you also need to take your mind off it sometimes. Being with Scott's friend isn't going to help you do that. I see what you're saying, I acknowledge. Don't worry, I have other friends at school too. She's relieved by my lie. It's okay to go out and have fun with them. It doesn't mean that you've forgotten the friends you lost. I want to forget them. My feelings are too complicated now that I've discovered Scott and Chloe's betrayal. Scott hadn't even felt guilty about it, according to Silas. And Chloe? How could she do that to me? I can't even confront her about it because she's dead. My memories of our friendship are now tainted with the knowledge of what she did behind my back. It gnaws at me while I wait for my parents to go to sleep so that I can sneak out of the house. It's after midnight when I leave to get Silas, and by that time I'm determined to get the details from him. His face lights up when he sees me, and he comes bounding up to me like an eager puppy. You came back. I told you I would, I remind him tersely. His happy expression changes to concerned. What's wrong? Nothing, I snap. Everything's just great. Did you have a nice time here? Yes, he says. Everyone was friendly. Really? I query. Who's everyone? He pulls several slips of paper out of his pockets and hands them to me. They all assumed that I left my phone at home. I read the names written on the slips of paper along with phone numbers. Megan, Caitlin, Alyssa, Madison, Rachel. Well, I remark, I guess you're a real guy. Yes, he agrees. Everyone can still see me. Well, I continue as I thrust the papers back at him. I can see why Abel doesn't think you want to be a priest. Abel? He exclaims eagerly. Is he here? No, I tell him. He came to my room. Let's get back before my parents wake up. I lead him out to my car as he peppers me with questions about Abel's visit. He took care of everything, I explain. He even got you a guardian, but he doesn't think you want to live at the priest school. I don't, Silas confirms. I want to go to school with you. Why? I ask in annoyance. Because you're the only person I know, he replies. Oh, you already know lots of girls, I note sarcastically. But you're the only one who knows me, he says. You're the only person in the entire world who really knows me. I stop short and look at him beneath the electric lights in the nearly empty parking lot. He's so familiar to me standing there in his black clothes, looking exactly the same as he has every time I've seen him. You need more clothes, I realize. I'm speaking to him in a softer tone now. I don't have any money, he states. Not yet, I tell him wryly. Abel probably took care of that too. I sigh in acceptance. Come on, I'll get you something to sleep in. We go back into the store and I find him a pair of cheap pajama pants. Fortunately, I have a little money with me in my purse, but it's not enough to buy him a new outfit. Where did you get those clothes? I ask curiously once we're out of the store again. I don't know, he tells me. They were different in the past. You mean they changed? I question in amazement. I assume so, he says. I noticed they were different from before. You just woke up wearing different clothes? I ask, thinking of how my earring changed overnight after he touched it. I didn't sleep, he informs me. At one point, I just noticed that they were different. You didn't sleep ever? I stress in astonishment. 
For centuries? For all that time? People are always dying, he reminds me. The thought of constantly staying awake for hundreds, no, thousands of years, is beyond belief. I focus instead on the topic of his clothes. What were you wearing before? Different pants and shirts, he answers. Always in this color. I had a tunic in earlier times. A tunic, I repeat. He told me how long he'd been around, but the mental image of him dressed in ancient clothing really drives it home. What about a cloak? I tease. No, he says before sitting down in the passenger seat and shutting the door. It almost seems like he's closing himself off from the conversation, but that could just be my shift in mood. I want to know about Chloe and Scott, I declare as I sit down in the car. When did it happen? No, he states. What do you mean, no? I ask when he doesn't elaborate. That's over, he says. I'm not what I was. I must stop looking back and live as what I am now. You don't have to forget who you were, I insist. You still have your memories. But you're not asking about my memories, he argues. Those memories should have died with them. I should never have spoken of them. That's not really what you're upset about, I tell him angrily. You wish that you'd let me die so that you could live forever. No, he repeats, but his entire manner has changed, and he speaks with an intensity I've never heard from him. Don't ever think that, Mila. I've never been able to change anything before. I've seen other suicides, but I could do nothing to stop them. I've always been the messenger of death, he continues. Everyone who saw me was doomed. You're the only one who wasn't, and I'll never regret that. It's impossible for me to ask him about Chloe and Scott again after such a declaration. So I slowly place the key in the ignition and start the car. I pull out onto the street and begin to drive home. Tell me about when you saw an angel, I request softly. Despite what he said about not wanting to look back, he tells me the story. Many women used to die during childbirth, and I often attended to them. In this instance, the baby died first. Oh, I exclaim, how sad. Did the baby see you? No, he replies. It was stillborn, but I saw it alive in the angel's arms. The midwife held the dead baby, but it was alive in the arms of the angel. The baby's soul, I say in awe. It is believed that angels carry the souls of babies to heaven. Silas tells me. That's so beautiful, I sniff. Why are you crying? He asks in dismay. Because it's so beautiful, I wail. Humans get emotional, I reply after a shaky breath. Should I be crying too? He questions uncertainly. I laugh through my tears. We'll save that for later. Like when my dad finds you hiding in my room. I'm joking. Since my dad is not a violent man. Then again, he's never discovered that a guy is spending the night in my bedroom. You'd better make sure that doesn't happen, I warn.